गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स एज यू आर अवेयर दैट द इंडियन अकेडमी ऑफ एको कार्डियोग्राफी इज ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दीज वेबनार्स ऑलमोस्ट ट्वाइस ए मंथ ऑन सब्जेक्ट्स विच आर वेरी कॉमन एंड प्रैक्टिकल फ्रॉम डे टू डे प्रैक्टिस पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू एज सच टूडे वी हैव चोजन दी चैप्टर ऑन एटिक स्टिनोसिस as you know aortic stenosis is one of the most common primary valvular heart disease especially in western countries and possibly because in the in, in a lifetime of an individual the aortic valve opens and closes almost 3.3 billion times under a high pressure system and because of the aging population and this stress and strain the incidence is going on increasing almost 25% of the persons beyond the age of 65 years have an aortic sclerosis and a certain percentage of these go into a moderate or a severe aortic stenosis over a period of 6 to 8 years or so as you know echo is the primary modality for a full evaluation of aortic stenosis and a clinical disease are making while other non invasive techniques are usually used whenever there is a doubt or discrepancy in findings and the cardiac catheterization as you know is hardly done nowadays to in aortic stenosis so to discuss all these aspects of aortic stenosis including a step by step evaluation their limitations and solutions we have none other than dr nitin burkle he is one of the finest orators in our country a highly respected cardiologist and eco cardiographer for several decades in this place he has conducted a large number of workshops in every aspect of eco cardiography throughout the country for several decades or so he has the privilege of being a co-author in one of the american site of echo guidelines on on asd and patent foramen oval and he has also contributed a lot of important guidelines for our own academy he has been a president of the indian academy of echo cardiography in the past currently he is a consultant cardiologist and director of non invasive cardiology at jupiter hospital thane mumbai before we pass over to nitin what i can tell you that don't go back with any doubt or so whatever is doubt or a question in your mind please put it across because we may extend over the over the stipulated time so now over to nitin one of the greatest speakers of our country nitin please uh thank you dr parashar sir uh, for the kind words i will now put up my presentation uh dear friends uh, i know the audience will have the entire spectrum of echocardiographers at various stages of their career right from basic to advanced so let us cover all the aspects right from the basic to advanced in the in depth analysis of aortic stenosis we know this is the way we diagnose the severe aortic stenosis and the generally the aortic gradient uh, mean gradient should be more than 40 wall area less than 1 index wall area less than 0.6 there are other indices of severity uh, which we hardly use except this valvulo arterial impedance this is very handy because the numerator is the mean gradient of aortic stenosis and systolic pp that means the entire after load that the lv faces divided by the stroke volume index if it is more than 5 you know that the lv is really suffering how and what to measure so let us start that when you take a patient of aortic stenosis what are the things you are going to look first measure height and weight body surface area blood pressure heart rate rhythm look at the clinical picture his ecg for lvh and strain look at the x ray for ascending aorta dilatation and most important look the previous echo data for the gradients and valve areas 
we will be using the continuity equation for the aortic wall assessment and as you know the continuity equation numerator is the stroke volume divided by aortic velocity time integral and stroke volume you get by the cross sectional area of LVOT for that you should have meticulous measurement of the radius and then the LVOT velocity time integral to get the and then measure the ejection time of the entire systole. Uh, from these, you get stroke volume, which is pi r square into LVOT uh, VTI. Then you get the aortic volume by stroke volume divided by aortic uh, velocity time integral. And you get transvalvular flow rate, which is stroke volume divided by the systolic ejection time. So how to calculate the stroke volume? Now, the crux of the problem is our cross-sectional area of the LVOT for which you should have a perfect measurement of the LVOT, uh, LVOT from inner edge to inner edge in mid-systole. Secondly, you also should have the measurements of the sinus of Valsava, sinotubular junction, ascending aorta. All these three measurements has to be taken in diastole and they are to be taken leading edge to leading edge. Now, how do you know that you are in the center of the LVOT if you assume that the LVOT is circular? Now, generally, you should be from the midpoint of the RCC cus to the commissure between the LCC and NCC. Now, how do you know about it? If both the leaflets are looking of the same size, probably you are cutting through the center. If you have got eccentric cutting like this, you will find the leaflets unequal. Of course, this doesn't hold true for bicuspid aortic wall. Secondly, your measurement should be perfectly perpendicular to the long axis of LVOT and aorta. You have to have perfect long axis and perpendicular to that. The LVOT mid-systole, inner edge to inner edge, the sinus of Valsava, sinotubular ejection, ascending aorta, leading edge to leading edge and in diastole. Remember this. Secondly, there are certain sources of error. When you look at the LVOT flow, you will find the flow, uh, the flow acceleration near the aortic wall. Never put your PW sample in the flow acceleration. You should be slightly away into the LVOT. Uh, uh, your PW sample should be located. Then when you get the PW uh, spectra Doppler, uh, if you have got this nice white line around it, you know that there is no spectral broadening and that means you are not in the flow acceleration. Now this white line is called as the modal velocity because most of the RBCs are moving at that speed. So you have to take a velocity time integral by planimetering the outer border of this uh, uh, modal velocity. Secondly, you have to measure everything, the aortic wall VTI, LVOT VTI at a very high Doppler swift speed. Never do it at a slow swift speed. Use the maximum swift speed. And what is more important is that you measure your ejection time from the ejection click, the, the opening click and the closing click that you see it on the Doppler signals, especially the CW signals. Secondly, average, average, average. You should be averaging more than five bits to get the best outcome of your study. Reduce the interstudy variability and even reduce the inter individual variability in your echo lab. So always average, average, and average. If there is an atrial fibrillation, though the guidelines mention for you, you average 10 bits. Take the RR intervals which are closer to each other. Allah, do, and do not take those RR intervals which are very short or very long. So secondly, obtaining the highest gradient. Now, once you get the uh, CW envelope across the aortic wall, measure the ejection time, ET, and also measure the acceleration time and measure the AT divided by ET. Now, this is a patient where we are getting from five chamber view peak systolic gradient of 56 and mean of 33. Now, the same patient, if we look from the right parasternal view, suddenly we get a gradient of 80 by 48. So, remember 20% of the patients get high gradient through right parasternal window. So, you have to explore all the possible windows, the uh, five chamber, right parasternal, even sometimes subcostal and suprasternal to get the maximum gradient so that your CW Doppler should be perfectly parallel to the velocity uh, to the uh, ejection jet across the aortic wall. So the same patient, if we had uh, used the five chamber view, we would have got the wall area of one. When we use the right parasternal, we got the wall area of 0.8. There are other methods of AS measurement and as I, as I told you, our crux of the problem is the cross-sectional area of the LVOT. 
so the thing is you can directly planimeter the aortic valve area but the thing is your viewing plane should be exactly at the tip of the open leaflets in mid systole so this is at rest and this is after the vuta I mean that you can see the valve area is increased this is very easy especially if you are using te with a biplane because the viewing plane you can always put it exactly at the tip of the aortic leaflets um, second is you can use a 3d data set from the te and then adjust your viewing plane perfectly perpendicular to the open leaflets in mid systole now there are ways by cmr also you can measure the uh, measure the uh, exact planimetry of the open aortic wall second is a hybrid method uh, as i told you the problem is our cross sectional area because it is never circular so if we take a radius we are assuming that it is circular as you know it is always oblong so you can use a ct lvot data set for the cross sectional area and then use your lvot vti to multiply it to get the slope volume and divide it by aortic vti because as i told you doppler is the strength of echocardiography so what we are losing is only getting a perfect cross sectional area so you can get that either by a 3d data set of echo or a ct or even from a cmr second is the problem of pressure recovery and i will go through it pressure recovery is what gradient you have got multiplied by 2 then you multiply it by the aortic valve area that you have calculated by the uh, continuity equation divided by the cross sectional area of the aorta at the sinotubular junction into in a bracket 1 minus again use the same ratio now what what is the pressure recovery because as the flow comes towards the stenotic orifice you have a vena contracta where you have got the maximum kinetic energy maximum flow and that is what you use for the 4v square equation by doppler to get radian however when you have got a very high uh, uh, kinetic jet here the pressure around it drops and as the jet recovers in the ascending aorta some of this kinetic energy gets converted to the potential energy and the pressure rises now generally on the cath you will put the aortic catheter somewhere at the, near the sinotubular junction so that is why there will be a discrepancy in the gradients that you get from lv to ascending aorta because the doppler will be over estimating it and this is called as the pressure recovery so let us look at the example now this patient has got a peak gradient of 60 wall area by continuity is 0.9 ascending aorta is 25 mm so the cross sectional area comes to around 4.9 cm square so we find the pressure recovery 60 is our gradient into 2 the ratio of ava by the ascending aorta cross sectional area into 1 minus again the same ratio and here we get the equation 18 mm of hg so you subtracted 18 mm of hg from 60 and the true gradient is 42 so does it really matter in the clinical practice yes it matters in certain situation now this is a very important study the y axis shows the gradient which is measured by doppler and the x axis shows the gradient measured by the cath now suppose this line moves in 45 degrees that means there is a very good agreement if the line moves here that means the uh, doppler is overestimating than the cath gradient now if you see the lines which are made by the aorta which was say 18 mm or the patients who had got aorta of 24 mm all all lying in this quadrant that means whenever you have an aorta which is less than 30 mm then generally the doppler is over estimating than the cath that means the pressure recovery is coming into play so from 30 mm onward actually most of these graphs are lying in the center so that means whenever you have a patient whose sinotubular junction is less than 30 think of pressure recovery in most of the adult patient you may not have to worry about it then the eccentricity of the jet if the jet is very eccentric the kinetic energy is immediately converted to the potential energy so it really doesn't matter if you have got a central jet then there can be a pressure recovery will say a regular case of an asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis he is a 52 year old person he is a climber hiker he is completely asymptomatic regular echo follow up bp of 140 90 body surface area of 1.9 and this is his echo you can see there is a calcific aortic stenosis and there is a lvh and this is his peak by mean gradient of 74 by 45 but this is not the only thing that we should be reporting 
what we should be reporting is not only the aortic wall area by continuity but also uh, it is corrected to the body surface area and this particular gradient of aorta 74 by 44 we have got it at a stroke volume of 40 ml per meter square with a transvalvular flow of 277 ml per second this is very very mandatory that at what hemodynamic condition you measure this and also you have to put a line about the ascending aorta size and never never forget the gls ef you are going to uh, write that i know but never never forget about the longitudinal function that is e prime and the gls you can see that this patient has a normal ef but the gls is 12 percent now, what to report in our uh, echo report? We have to tell about the body surface area and PP at which we recorded the gradients, the LVOT diameter, that is the aortic uh, annulus diameter, the LVOT VTI, stroke volume, index to body surface area, aortic VTI, uh, aortic ET, and AT divided by ET, that is acceleration time divided by ejection time, transvalvular flow rate, Aortic wall area corrected to body surface area, valvular calcification, aortic diameter in diastole at sinotubular junction, all the LV sizes including LV mass, LV global longitudinal strain, and EF and diastolic function. This whole thing has to be reported. Will now this patient is completely asymptomatic. Now, is it a low risk condition? Let me tell you, it is not such a benign. So look, look at the natural history and let us look at the contemporary natural history. And this comes uh, while the current guidelines tell us that you can send a patient of asymptomatic severe AS to surgery only if the EF is less than 50 or he's undergoing for some other bypass surgery or his velocity is above 5 meters, mean gradient above 60 or he has an abnormal uh, ET, uh, the treadmill test or his increase in the, gray, uh, in the velocity is more than 0.3 meter per year. However, it's doubtful whether the eje ejection fraction 50% is correct or not. Because if you see the natural history, uh, as you can see, the y-axis is the survival and x-axis is the years of follow. The red line tells you about the survival of EF with less than 50%. Green line tells you of survival of patients with EF between 50 to 60%. And both of them are actually very parallel and close to each other telling us that when the EF drops below 60%, you are already in a high-risk zone. The second thing is that uh, this is a this is a Austrian group uh, which has uh, uh, showed the natural history of severe asymptomatic AS in elderly patients uh, published recently in 2017. And what they say, that 8% of these patients die in between the follow-up visits to wall clinics and the death is because of acute LVF. And the acute LVF comes as an abrupt severe symptoms in half of these patients. And once they have an abrupt LVF, their surgical mortality increases and even their long-term survival is poor. Uh, so the clinical events of death or symptoms or heart failure or AVR are there in one third of patients by end of one year and more than half the patient in two years. So they do not have a very benign course. So if the patient is, uh, is calls himself asymptomatic, is he really asymptomatic? So you have to do exercise testing. And one third patient becomes symptomatic on treadmill. Do a very graded exercise test till only 80% of target heart rate, no 85%. Then you promptly stop the exercise at 80% target heart rate or symptom or hypotension or arrhythmias. And what is the positive stress test? Either of these, angina, dyspnea, dizziness, syncope, more than two millimeter ST depression, failure to increase systolic BP or fall more than 20 mm of Hg, ventricular arrhythmias. And if you are doing an exercise echo, then in that case, increase in the E by E prime at peak uh, exercise, the ACE mean gradient increasing by 20, the PA pressure increasing more than 60, failure to increase ejection fraction more than 5%, uh, fall in the GLS or failure to increase it by more than 1.5%, and fail to increase the S prime more than five centimeters. And if you have got cardiopulmonary exercise, then whether the peak VO2 is less than uh, 84%. Now, patient may be asymptomatic, but is his myocardium is really, really a sick? We should know that. And that is why we should uh, do the myocardial imaging. So in ACO, now look away from the aortic wall and look at the myocardium. So look at the ejection fraction, look at the LV mass, look at the GLS, whether it is fallen or not, look at the E by E prime, 
and there is also one entity called by e upon instead of e prime early diastolic strain rate so first is gls very important the echo gives you beautiful gls now mr has also started giving you gls and it is the most sensitive marker of deformation or altered myocardial tech altered myocardial ultra structure so the thing is uh, the e by uh, e prime you can uh, substitute it by e upon uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the strain rate in the early diastole and this is a study from mayo clinic but it's little cumbersome to do what we really want to see is the myocardial fibrosis whether there is a interstitial fibrosis or whether there is a replacement fibrosis that means the myocytes are getting replaced by the fibrosis in an asymptomatic as and this we can see by variety of ways that fall in the gls and on the mri there are different things like they look at the late gadolin enhancement they look at something called as a t1 map and something called as extracellular maps which are the parametric imagings how do you integrate it in an asymptomatic aortic stenosis patient so this is what dr tom marvik has suggested that if the ef starts is above 55% then in that case look at the gls now if the gls is more than 18% then you can uh, follow this patient one yearly if it is between 16 to 18 follow him every six monthly and if it has already fallen below 16 look at the cmr and if it shows fibrosis then better go for an early avr there is a prognostic classification of as also and this comes from the partner study of partner 2 tower study now this is a this is actually very straight forward they have a stage 0 where only valve aortic valve is involved stage 1 where the lv has become hypertrophied and e by e prime has increased and the ef has fallen stage 2 is when the la has dilated and there is a atrial fibrillation or the mitral regurgitation has started stage 3 is when the ph has developed and tr has developed and stage 4 is that your rv dysfunction and the mortality goes on increasing from stage 0 to stage 4 but what is more important for us the hemodynamic classification and that is totally depend upon the flows and the gradients now the flows cut off is 35 ml per meter square for the stroke volume and the gradient cut off is 40 ml so you will have four combinations from these four entities now this was the first report which came from dr pibara from uh, in uh, in journal of uh, circulation imaging 2007 and from that everything changed and people started talking about the low flow gradients so from this we can have four types like you can have a normal flow low gradient normal flow high gradient low flow high gradient and low flow low gradient now of this we are not going to discuss this normal flow low gradient because they are benign they have benign history they behave like moderate uh, aortic stenosis what remains is the other three of these also the high gradient one is very easy to take the decision because we have the guidelines for that the question always come for the low flow low gradient patients that means you have a flow which is less than 35 ml per meter square and gradient less than 40 mm of hg this is the most complicated group and this group is further differentiated depending upon the ejection fraction so if you have a low ejection fraction this is called as a classical low flow low gradient as and it has got three types those with contractile reserve are uh, those with true as and those without contractile reserve but have true as and those which are have a contractile reserve but they when they give dobutamin the stroke volume increases and the aortic wall opens and you are you are no more severe aortic stenosis while when you have got a normal ejection fraction it is called as paradoxical low flow low gradient as and there are three types there are true as pseudo as or it can be a measurement error so we'll what we'll do is first we'll look at this whole complication created by the stroke volume now there is a strong indicator that the better indicator is a transvalvular flow rate you know the stroke volume is just a volume ejected across the valve but transvalvular flow rate is the stroke volume per systolic ejection time so it actually tells you the aortic wall resistance and the strength of the lv to push the blood you can push the same amount of blood over a longer period but if you have really a good energy you will uh, you will pump that blood in a shorter time and your transvalvular flow rate will be higher so it seems that the transvalvular flow rate is a better indicator and there is a large study of more than 1000 patients with their prognostic data over 7 years published by dr judy hum from mash journal in april 
and what they show that patients with high gradient as almost half of them have their flow gradients low while in low gradient as almost 80% of them have their uh, transvalvular flow rates low not only that those patients who are supposed to have normal flow that means more than 35 ml per meter square almost one third of them have low transvalvular flow rate and that is why not all of them behave normally some of them are really high risk and this clearly showed in thousand patient followed up over more than more than 7 years that the uh, the patients with low transvalvular flow rate shown by this blue line have a worse outcome and according to them that if the transvalvular flow rate is uh, less than 240 or less than 200 ml in their validation cohort then actually even the aortic wall area loses is signif prognostic significance so the thing is first we will look at the classical low flow low gradient as how to differentiate a true as versus pseudo as so these are all sick patients but ef is also low so this is a where this is a place where you lose low dose jovitamine so we'll see a case is a 81 year old gentleman hypertensive history of lvf ihds and pcis bp of 170 80 body surface area of 1.78 and you can see this is EF is low and you can see that the LV, the aortic valve is hardly opening. It is calcified and uh, there is no uh, aortic regurgitation. There's a very trivial aortic regurgitation, very mild air and a significant uh, probably aortic stenosis. And these are these images of his uh, LV four chamber, two chamber and long axis. And you can see the EF must be hardly around 25%. So, so let us look at the data. He's mean gradient is 27 stroke volume is 28 ml per meter square and transvalvular flow rate is well below 200 that is 186 ml per second so he's a, a low ef that is classical low flow low gradient aortic stenosis so we'll give him dobutamine so what is the uh, why you want to give low dobutamine first thing we want to see whether the contractile reserve is there or not that is when i give dobutamine whether there is enough myocardium to get recruited to increase the stroke volume more than 20% from the baseline. It is very good if it goes above 30 ml, 35 ml per meter square and whether the transvalvular flow rate is going to increase about 200 ml or not. Now once, so that way I can differentiate the classical into those with contractile reserve without contractile reserve. And my second name is that if there is a contractile reserve, then I will recheck the gradient and aortic valve areas at an acute stroke volume more than 20% from the baseline and a transvalvular flow rate about 200 and if i don't achieve that i will mathematically project it to a flow rate of 250 ml per second so in that case if the patient's wall area remains below one at peak dobutamine and does not change more than 0.3 or his mean gradient goes above 40 changes by more than 10 and his 80 by 80 that means acceleration time divided by ejection time remains above 0.3 this is a true severe aortic stenosis now let us look at this patient this is five mic at which we are there then we are at 10 mic at each stage you see lvot vti aortic vti and the ejection time you don't have to measure lvot uh, size again and again this is 15 microgram and this is what we get now we see the dobutamine which we have increased from 0 5 7 .5, 10 15 let us look at the stroke volume which was 51 which has slowly increased to 65 that means more than 15 ml, so more than 20%. His, uh, wall, uh, his mean gradient has increased from 27 to 40 and his wall area from 0.7 to 0.8. That means there is only change of 0.1, not 0.3. So that means this patient, first, he has a contractile reserve and secondly, he is a true severe aortic stenosis. Now we'll see another case, 70-year-old lady, dyspnea on exertion, hypertension, and uh, she's on the routine echo follow-up with a uh, patient with a very severe LV dysfunction. And you can see that there is a severe calcific aortic stenosis. Look at the LV, which is quite significantly depressed. And if you look at the LV, there is a, so much of dyssynchrony. So probably she has a LVBB. And this is her uh, readout. Her peak by mean gradient is 52 by 30. So mean gradient is 30. Her stroke volume is 30 ml per meter square. Transvalvular flow rate of 156 ml. So she is a really a low gradient, low flow, severe aortic stenosis of classical variety. 
So we'll give her dobutamine, 5 mic, 10 mic, 15 mic, 20. You will take the LVOT and also the aorta. You will average it in each stage. You will average, average, average. And also you will take the ejection time. Let us look what happens. Now this is the dose from 0, 5, 10, 15, 20. What happens to the main gradient? 32 to 37, hardly any change. What happens to the stroke volume? 52, 57, 44. So it has actually dropped because the heart rate must have increased. Uh, that is why the uh, stroke volume has a drop. Then what happens to the valve area? 0 0.58, 0 0.6, hardly any change. 0 0.58 to 0.64. So this patient does not have any contractile reserve. Neither you could increase the stroke volume, neither you could increase the transvalvular flow rate. Maximum you got was 184. So you can't believe this aortic valve area. So first thing that we know that this patient does not have a contractile reserve. Then what? One way is to do the projected aortic valve area. So uh, easy way is that you plot your data points of flow rate here on the x-axis and on the y-axis plot the aortic valve area. So we had these three data points of his flow rate and his valve area there you can increase that line, the same slope to an ar uh, to this 250 ml arbitrary point and check whether it is remains still severe. Or you can use this equation where you get the valve compliance and then put that valve compliance into this uh, equation to get the projected aortic valve area. Or it is more than 2000 and in female if it is more than 1200 agastin unit it is a definite severe as however it is less than 1600 in male less than 800 in female it is unlikely to be severe as and you have a border zone in between uh, why we should know the contractile reserve because in the avr era if you had a contractile reserve if you have got a low ef severe as and you have a contractile reserve as is shown by the uh, red graph then your survival after AVR is very good. However, if you don't have contractile reserve, as shown by the blue bar, your survival after AVR is low. However, it is still better than the medical management, but look that there is a significant attrition at the surgery. That means there is a lot of perioperative death if you don't have contractile reserve. However, the things have changed with TAVR. In the TAVR, whether you have a contractile reserve shown by the or you don't have contract reserve as shown by the blue graph, your increment in the ejection fraction is the same. So also, your long-term mortality is also the same, whether you have contract reserve positive or negative. So the TAVR is a game changer. So that so in the TAVR, your low-dose dobutamine contract reserve doesn't predict the, the uh, improvement in ejection fraction or survival. And the TAVR is a treatment of choice in the classical low flow, low gradient AS, especially if there is no contractile reserve. So this was the graph that these classical low flow, low gradient AS with dobutamine, we see whether they have a reserve or no reserve. We saw the case of no reserve, TAVR is favored. If you have a reserve, true AS, still the TAVR is, preserved, uh, is, uh, uh, is preferred. However, if you, are, you have a contractile reserve and the wall area goes above 1.2, then what? That means this is the group of patients who have a moderate AS and LV dysfunction together. Now, these patients are being investigated by TAVR in this trial called TAVR Unload, and we are awaiting its results. If this also shows benefit, then our job will be very simple. Then we'll come to the other vexing problem of patients who have got a low flow, low gradient AS, but the ejection fraction is perfectly normal. And these are called as paradoxical low flow. And we'll see a case, 80-year-old lady, hypertensive, CKD, LVF, NYHA class 3, and she has got a, a, a LVH with normal EF. And this is a very classical echo of this kind of patients. Now, first of all, you can see that these LVs are small in size. They are severe LVH. You also have a lot of mitral wall annular calcification in these patients, and they have got big atrias. And generally, they will also have something related to the calcification uh, on to the AV node. So she also, you can see there is a, a permanent pacemaker also in this patient with aortic stenosis. And uh, you can see that she also has a secondary mitral regurgitation. So this is also there because of the increased afterload of ACE and also because of the mitral wall degeneration. She has a TR there. You can see there is a significant pH and also the E prime is very low. Now, this patient, so you can see the stroke volume is 28 and the uh, transvalvular flow rate is just 160. 
and the mean gradient is 30. So she is a classical low flow, low gradient with normal EF, that is paradoxical low flow, low gradient theoreotic stenosis. Now, what to do of these patients? Now, these patients have very classical, clinical, and echo features. One is that they are elderly, they are women. They are hypertensive, they have got a significant uh, exercise intolerance and they present more as hepeps. They have multiple comorbidities because of obesity, CKD, COPD, hypertension, hypothyroidism, so and so forth. Then their echo has got severe LVH, they have got a low size uh, LV internal diameters, reduced LV GLS, reduced E primes, S primes, reduced LV compliance, they have got a very high value low arterial impedance and they have got myocardial fibrosis uh, on the MRI and they have got a significant mitral annular calcification. So these patients, like all these AS patients with preserved ejection fraction, the ones with low flow, low gradient have got the uh, highest cardiac event rates. So that means they are sicker patients also. And the problem is that the outcome is not good even after AVR. If you see this, uh, this particular graph, Y axis is the survival and this is the follow up on the X axis. Uh, after AVR plus or minus CABG, you can see that their survival is better than the medical management, but still it is very poor as compared to all those patients with normal EF with a high gradient aortic stenosis. Those patients really have a very good survival after AVR. And why this happens? Because they have a restrictive LV. Post-operative, they go into low output state and you cannot give more inotropes because of the small LV and the patient prosthetic mismatch is almost a rule. So what do you do? So you have to, when you want to send a symptomatic patient of paradoxical low flow, low grade AS to surgery, you have to reconfirm the severity. You see that whether there is a really severe LVH after adequate control of BP, check the stroke volume after perfect control of BP because that afterload can also reduce your stroke volume. So check that uh, the BP is controlled over a few months. He remains in LVH, he remains stroke volume, remains low. He has a really reduced LV longitudinal function like GLS and E prime and S prime. If the aortic wall area is below pointed, again, that is reassuring. And if the mean gradient is above 30, then also it is reassuring that you are not having any measurement issues. Despite that, do multiple meticulous stroke volume calculations uh, after BP control, again and again stressing after BP control. And you can use a hybrid method of getting the cross-section of LVOT from the other modalities. And secondly is that use cardiac CT in these patients. If the uh, Agastin units are more than 2000 in male or 1200 in female, again, you can reconfirm that this is a truly severe ACE. And low dose dobutamine is very difficult to do in these patients because of the low LV cavity size. So what do you do? You can use hand grip. And this is what is shown by this group from MASH General. Uh, in that particular study uh, that if you use hand grip, it augments the transvalular flow rate and you can go over 200 ml without increasing the cardiac output, but by reducing the ejection time. And this probably works out well, the hand grip in these particular patients of paradoxical low flow, low gradient ACE. So the thing is this mass general group by uh, 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 Dr. Judy Han, they suggest that you take away the stroke volume from the equation. So what do you do? You use a transvalular flow rate. So what you do is that uh, look at the aortic wall area if it is less than one square centimeter. If the gradient above 40, you don't have to worry. That is a true severe. If the gradient is less than 40, that means severe is low gradient. Now don't go for a stroke volume index, but you go for a transvalular flow rate. Now if your transvalular flow rate is about 200, rest assured that this wall area calculation is correct and this is truly severe S. But if it is low, then go for other investigations like CT calcium score, hand grip to increase the uh, transvalular flow rate, so and so forth, and use all other your clinical judgment to decide that this is truly a paradoxical low flow, low gradient severe ACE. So uh, friends, the low gradient aortic stenosis, now we know that there are three of them. The classical one, definitely the tower is now preferred in these patients. The paradoxical one, probably tower will be better in these patients. But remember, some of them are not going to improve because there are truly hepeps because of advanced myocardial fibrosis. So you have to be very careful, have a good clinical judgment points as I had enumerated earlier. And then comes this patient of normal flow, low gradients. They are called D4. There are still no recommendations in the guidelines about it because this is still a controversial topic. 
Now, so there are, so which patients you will send for TAVR? So there are certain clinical features like the uh, SPS score more than 4%, age above 75, frailty. That means you are dependent on someone else for more than three activities of daily living, like say bathing, eating, walking, so and so forth, severe restricted mobility, previous cardiac surgery, anatomical ones is like expected patient prosthetic mismatch, like small annulus, feasibility of iliofemoral access, because remember towers done through the femoral always have better outcome than the does done transapically, then severe chest deformity, chest radiation, porcelain aorta, or the previous CAVG, the graft is added to the sternum. Now, when you, are, when you, you start getting involved in the tower, your role of echocardiographer is important in the cath lab. Now, most of the uh, interventionalists have shifted to transthoracic imaging and it's always a challenge. These are elderly patients lying on their back. You have got a little access from one side of the gantry. So remember that transthoracic is very challenging and you may not get always good images like this. The T is very easy to do, but it is it requires a GA and that is why it is almost given up. Then the thing is, uh, when, the, uh, the, when the implant is being done, look at the depth of the implant and see that it is not encroaching up above the AML and it remains exactly at the aortomitral curtain. Then look for the new onset of regional wall motion abnormality that tells you that there is no coronary embolization. Look for intraprosthetic lift, that means uh, leak, that means uh, if one of the leaflet fails to close down, that can produce a torrential regurgitation. Then look for paravalvular leaks immediately. Then look for the prosthetic valve gradient. Then look for any new pericardial effusion because of the root rupture. And then uh, if, you, if you can't cross the wall anterogradely, then for uh, uh, retrogradely, then for anterograde crossing, you need an interatrial septal puncture. Mm -hmm. For that, you will need a transesophageal echo. So this is your role as an echocardiographer in the cath lab. And uh, the thing is of which most important is the paravalvular leak uh, uh, finding. And how do you estimate the paravalvular leak? You see that leak by the vena contracta. If the vena contracta is more than 6 millimeter, it is severe. Then you look at the vena contracta area in short axis. If it is more than 0.3 square centimeter, it is severe. And then you look for the circumference of uh, the leak. If it is more than 30% of the entire circumference, it is again severe. And you can see the descending thoracic aorta for flow reversal. And I will show you an example, like this is a patient, you have to use all possible views to look for the paravalvular leak. Like in this patient, in this parasternal long axis, apical long axis, you are not seeing the leak. But in the five chamber view, you are started seeing the uh, paravalvular leak. Now remember, these images will not be great because they are being done when the patient is lying on the cath lab table. And this is how you can see the leak here. And you can see the coronary flow there, but there is a leak here. Uh, after the implantation of the evolute R, and how do you measure it? So one is that you take the entire circumference. You can see the diameter here, and you know that the leak is almost one fourth. That is almost twenty-five percent of the circumference. Anything which is thirty percent and more is taken as a severe paravalvular leak. And then what you can do is that you can look at this vena contracta area, but and then vena contracta area you can planimeter it to get the areas, and you can add if there are multiple jets. And if that total area goes above point, uh, 0 0.3, like here it is 0 0.10, if it go above 0 0.3, adding all those VCS, it is severe. Post-tower follow-up is very important. What you will be looking in the post-tower patients, because many of you will get it in your echolabs. You look for the prosthetic mean gradient, but what is important is see that whether it has increased more than 50% of the pre-discharge. That is very important. So you should have a pre-discharge mean gradient of your tower patients and check with that what is the mean gradient in your follow-up tower patients. Then look for the restricted leaflet motion. Very important to look for it because that will be the early sign of leaflet thrombosis. Then look for thickening of the leaflets. If the leaflets are thickened, that means the clot has started coming up on the leaflets. Now, why we are so sensitive about it? See, all the earlier partner trials were done in very elderly people. So they were just put on the antiplatelets. And we know that our surgical colleagues put the patients of bioprosthetic wall on oral anticoagulation for the first three months. So that is why we are not putting it. And that is why the uh, leaflet can attract a clot. And secondly, you also look for the paravalvular leak, whether it is still there or it has vanished. 
because it can vanish especially in the self expanding valves so so how do you treat this uh, leaflet restriction and the thickening now this is the partner trial 3 cardiac ct sub study so they look for the thrombosis on cardiac ct at 30 days and at 1 year in all these patients what they find that at 30 days tavr patient have 30% incidence of hypoattenuated leaflet thickening that means the clot on the aortic valve and 5% in surgical patient obviously because the surgeon gives oral anticoagulants and at one year 28% of the tavr patient and 20% of the surgical bioprosthetic had the halt that is the hypoattenuated leaflet thickening that means thrombosis so this is quite a significant incidence now remember those patients who continue to have the uh, uh, leaflet thrombosis at 30 days and one year had a increase in gradients that means it produces some structural damage not only that those patients also have a higher incidence of tis and strokes so uh, so the so the so the current recommendation is that when you are following the tavr walls always look for the mean gradient if it is goes more than one and a half times that is more than 50% of the baseline look for the restricted cuspal motion if it is there then one way is that you can directly start oral anticoagulation or you can go for a cardiac ct but this requires to be ecg gated cardiac ct and look for the leaflet attenuation and leaflet restricted mobility now in that case if your gradients are increased without this that means this is a early prosthetic failure but if you have got this thickening that means this is thrombosis then you start oral anticoagulant for 3 months and then recheck the gradient generally the gradient uh, literally comes down significantly and then you keep a surveillance on that if it again starts increasing again start an oral anticoagulation especially the uh, vka that is the vitamin k antagonist so dear friends that is how we went through the entire spectrum of aortic stenosis and now all of us are ready for taking your questions thank you well uh, thank you dr borkle uh, you have given a sort of a wonderful deliberation on your text analysis and left very little scope for me to summarize the talk or so but as we always say that summary is the juice of the whole talk so possibly we'll try to recapitulate some of the important points which you have put forward in between i had gone out of the webinar because of some technical reasons so i did not know what to spoke or that so as you had pointed out or for everybody a clinical evaluation is a must before any echo examination and that you also recall what are some of the intercurrent illnesses which may affect our our doppler findings and then echo findings and as he has mentioned a recording of the heart rate and blood pressure is extremely important to have a good clinical evaluation and after clinical evaluation you next thing you come to 2d echo and i have always believed that a good 2d echo gives rise a good semi quantitation of a of any disease or any valvular disease for example if you have a heavy calcified your aortic valve if you have got a significant lvh this gives you a hint that you are dealing with a severe aortic stenosis and if you are if your echo findings are not matching it that means there is something wrong unless there is a there is a derange lv functions or various flow rates or so so that means a good 2d echo precise etiology gives you a good idea of the of what you are dealing with or so after you have done a 2d echo normally you come to a a, a gradients or so velocities of gradient whether they are high or low as have been pointed out high means more than 4 meters per second and mean more than 40 or so here i have say one point that is never never interrogate any post ectopic beat is respective of any disease never interrogate the gradient in a post ectopic beat and number two in your report always mention which window gave you the best gradient so that next time you start with the same window and there is a good correlation or so now here i may get, i may tell you some important a non echo related issue whenever a patient is referred to us for a for a review or other thing both the clinic both the clinician and the echo and the 
and the attendance and the patient is very much worried as to what disease he is suffering, what is the progress or so, and all these. So there's an intense worry. And there, and you see if there, there is any sort of a, a intercurrent illness which is going to affect the gradient, and you tell them, okay, you come after three weeks when this is corrected, they will never come back to you. Within the next two hours, they'll go to another hospital to get an echo done because of a concern. So normally what we do is we do an echo then in our final report, we strongly mention that this particular associated condition could affect our echo findings. And hence, it is suggested that a review as a continuation of this study may be done after so and such time. So our four purposes are served. Number one, an echo is done and the patient and the clinician is satisfied. Number two, when we say as a continuation of the study, it means that we are not going to charge you again and the patient will definitely come back to you of whenever the condition or associated condition is, is relieved or so, and then you can compare with your previous findings or so. So always have a C for any condition in a high output state or so, where you can differentiate whether it is a severe or a or a moderate aortic stenosis by seeing the gradients, not the post-ectopic one or so. Then as mentioned by, by Nitin, once you have seen the gradients, it can be high or low. And in a low gradient, always you see when it is less than 40, as he has mentioned, then the first thing you do is to find out an aortic wall area. I'm not going to discuss in detail, but you have to cross-check if your area is more than one, like 1 1.2, that means you are dealing with a moderate aortic stenosis. If it is less than one, then as he has mentioned, please recheck all your parameters. So when you were discussing LVOT, I was not present, but there are two, three points which to be to be noted in the LVOT is that that you you have to whatever diameters you have acquired in your adult age, possibly continue throughout your several years or so. So you always calculate a good LVOT diameter, taking at least three values and mention it in the report so that it can be a reference point for the next study because LVOT diameter usually does not change much. Then number two, some persons say mid systole some say end diastole but our policy is that throughout the systole, wherever you find the maximum LVOT diameter, we take it. So during the systolic during the systolic phase or so, then then he mentioned about the mean this LVOT VTI. So if you to, you take it as has been uh, told by him, but don't keep it more nearer the IVS or near the mitral wall because otherwise the values will be different. So you keep it at the center of the of the LVOT. So once you are satisfied with the aortic wall area. Then what you mentioned, then the next thing comes is a stroke volume or a total volume flow rate. And then you then the same procedure, what he has mentioned, is to be followed by a Daubert mean or so. Then thirdly, this, this Doppler velocity index. Of course, you must practice it because this is a very short, short sign of a severe stenosis when other methods sometimes fail. One thing in atrial fibrillation. There are mass various methods told that you take five beats or so, you take matching of the RR interval. But there was a recent article about two years back in, in the Journal of Echocardiography where they found that the most simplest is you take the maximum aortic velocity irrespective of how many beats are there. You take the maximum LVOT velocity and between the two VTI, you calculate the aortic ball. This, this this ratio or so, so going by the maximum velocity or so rather than going to the multiple factors or so. And then after this, you then you go to the various methods and as study he mentioned that a stage is coming that once we say whether 50% is all right, 50 to 60% is all right. And as you mentioned that some, some workers have said that more than 60% uh, is maybe the ideal ejection math factor or so. And then he has mentioned a, a, a stress echo, which should always be done in many situations, whether to, to see whether symptoms are present or not, whether these symptoms are related to the valvular disease or not, 
a various contractile reserve, and there are various indications. The common ones are severe asymptomatic aortic stenosis, a moderate symptomatic aortic stenosis, low flow, low grade, and also. So these are some of the methods, and always when you get an asymptomatic stenosis, look for high risk cases. The high risk cases of aortic stenosis are those those who have got a a sort of an old age, multiple comorbidities, extensive calcification, severe LVH, a velocity more than five meters per second, LV functions, GLS or so, pulmonary artery pressure. So there are many other issues which he has discussed or so. So now we'll take up some of the questions. So remember a stepwise evaluation is always better and go into the minute details of everything. So some of the questions which we can take up now. So, yeah, one, uh, one question from Dr. Konde is that the uh, same question that which have, what percentage of patients with paradoxical low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis with normal LV functions need AVR even after excellent control of BP? Is PPM not problem in these? Uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, the PPM is always a problem in the patients with uh, paradoxical low flow low grade. They always have a smaller aortic pole annulus. So that is why I told uh, that uh, the AVR decision is not to be taken so lightly in these patients, and many of them continue to be in heart failure with preserved EF even after the aortic wall replacement. So the thing is, finding out a true severe AS in this patient is one thing. And I think the best way is to do it by CT calcium score, one. And secondly, by increasing the transvalular flow rate by hand grip or so as to reduce the ejection time and increase the transvalular flow rate after excellent control of BP. And, uh, uh, and the, we have to also correlate that these symptoms are related to AS and not because of other comorbidities, which is also a clinical skill. With this, at least one third of uh, these patients will definitely have a true AS, which is because and the symptoms are exactly related to, to, uh, to because of this true aortic stenosis. So that means at least one third of these patients will be eligible for uh, uh, AVR or a TAVR. So the Nilover Fatma from Bangladesh, she wants to know what is the role of 2D GLS in decision making of early wall replacement, even in moderate aortic stenosis? Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, we really don't know the answer because the uh, algorithm that I showed you for the GLS uh, works for the severe asymptomatic aortic stenosis. That means asymptomatic severe S and is, uh, EF is very well preserved above 55%, then we are thinking about GLS and if the GLS falls tells you about the myocardial fibrosis. However, patients who are having a moderate AS and LV dysfunction, it's a chicken and egg situation. We don't know what came first. It could be that these two may be totally different diseases. That is a moderate AS and there is a cardiomyopathy, which is a separate thing or the moderate AS itself, because the patient is genetically more prone to develop LV dysfunction to a pressure after load, he may have developed LV dysfunction. So we do not know whether the moderate AS is the cause of LV dysfunction or not. So that is why I think there the GLS will just tell you about the prognosis of this patient as a heart failure patient. But I don't think we'll be able to use a GLS to decide about the AVR in this patient. And the answer will be, uh, we'll get the answer after we get the report of TAVR unload trial, which is, in, which is exactly including these patients. Mr. Govinda Paul says, how can we differentiate between aortic stenosis and mild AS considering gradient? What I feel that in patients of aortic sclerosis, there is a thickening of the cusp, but the opening is slightly better and the wall with the velocity is less than 2.5 meters per second, unless something he wants to add, Nitin. No, I think that's correct. I think. Okay, again, Dr. Konde, is it not rational to see coronary anatomy in low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis with reduced LVF before you do mean? Because if he has severe EAD, plan will change. Uh, uh, truly speaking, uh, all these patients have already got their coronary angiograms done. 
most of this because they present with heart failure or lv dysfunction so most of them already have the catheter coronary angiogram done but uh, let me tell you that in a low dose dobutamin we are not exceeding 15 or 20 mics at that very unlikely that we will provoke ischemia so that is why the uh, it is very unlikely that the ischemia will factor into the lv dysfunction uh, when we are assessing the gradients that is one issue a uh, second issue is that uh, even if these patients have a severe triple vessel disease knowing the contractile reserve is very important because if the contractile reserve is absent patient is undergoing cabg with avr we know that the perioperative mortality will be high uh, while the other patient who has got a, 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 a cr positive he has a contractile reserve positive and he goes for a cabg avr his perioperative mortality will be low so he is a, he almost becomes a class 1 indication according to the accaha guidelines however if taver is a plan then obviously uh, the uh, his contractile reserve will not come will not factor in but in that case you will also have to deal with the uh, pc multi vessel pci with a taver so mr goinda paul also asked what are the eco criteria for aortic wall replacement especially when severe but mildly symptomatic aortic stenosis with mild lv systolic dysfunction uh i think the moment you have a mild lv systolic dysfunction this is a time to go for surgery and the mild systolic dysfunction according to the acc ah criteria is ef falling below 50% or abnormal exercise test okay that is what is the uh, uh, acc ah guidelines are but as we know that for us uh, lv dysfunction is the reduced reduction in the longitudinal function of lv that is reduction in the e prime reduction in the gls or showing the myocardial fibrosis by other imaging techniques i think uh, uh, i think that is quite reasonable now to send these patients for early surgery if, if they are mild symptomatic and you already have a gls which is less than uh, say 15% and uh, significant lvh though the ef is more than 50% and uh, so i i think that's why i think uh, otherwise what happens is we do see patients who had an avr but they continue to come to you with uh, heart failure so aditi shri your question has already been answered that how to calculate transvascular flow rate you are already calculating stroke volume when you are calculating aortic wall area so you divide this stroke volume by the ejection time which has been shown by dr nitin how to calculate ejection time and this gives you the transvascular flow rate in millimeter unless he wants to add something yeah no, that's correct and i think now probably see what had happened as i told you that in 2007 dr pibarot uh, published his paper in circulation with the stroke volume using the stroke volume to decide whether it is low flow or high flow uh and that has actually given us a lot of mixed picture but now right from the beginning Uh, uh many other groups were telling that transvascular flow rate will be a better indicator for the flow because that is the way we actually forcefully opening the valve by the transvascular flow rate so uh, so that is why and now that uh, those groups are vindicated by this large study of more than 1000 patients with their prognosis data over 7 years from this mass general group uh, by dr judy ha and it shows that transvascular flow rate is the thing that you take into equation rather than stroke volume so when you have got a normal ef low gradient severe s look at the transvascular flow rate if it is more than 210 you really don't have to do anything more but if it is less than that then uh, you uh, go for all those city calcium scores and other things well pondey seems to be your good friend he, again he has asked that is nt pro bnp of more than 1600 guide for avr in paradoxical low flow low gradient with a normal lvf uh actually um i they really don't believe much on uh, nt pro bnp in this group of patients because as we know they have a hep pep which may be multifactorial and nt pro bnp will be a non specific marker of increased in the lv filling pressures so these people are long term hypertensives that is why they have myocardial fibrosis they have grade 3 lv diastolic dysfunction so the nt pro bnp is going to be high so that does not mean that the entire symptoms or heart failure is related to the aortic stenosis itself so if you uh, see this patient's uh, gva that is the uh, valvulo uh, 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 valvulo arterial impedance 
the numerator is the systolic bp plus mean gradient divided by stroke volume index so if the systolic bp is high lv is also going to suffer because the afterload is because of both systolic blood pressure and the transvalvular mean gradient too so that is where uh, i will disregard this antiprobian p because that just tells me that this patient is in hepep but that anyway i knew from the clinical judgment and that is not going to help me to decide about the avr actually bnp clinical has been used more for a prognostic point of view in which they have taken the bnp value divided by the bnp for that age and sex also and if it is more than one it continues to have a poor prognostic value regarding this indications you have already subjected or so but it is more of a prostatic value or so then dr dhan kumar is the tv fr calculation in all echo machines yeah it doesn't need anything because you are calculating the stroke volume you have to just take the ejection time so you take that cw see the aortic ejection click and closing click take the uh, take the time duration and uh, then just put it at the denominator so the numerator is stroke volume denominator is the ejection time and you get the transvalvular flow rate so uh, so i think you can uh, also automated uh, done also if you, if you are uh, you the machine uh, if your machine person can put it into the calculation package well, dr prashant rane wanted to know what is porcelain aorta what i think a porcelain aorta is a heavily calcified ascending thoracic aorta and this has got some implication on a wall replacement for the the surgeons have got some alternative techniques also so again surkant again please explain pressure recovery again i uh, think see uh, see i'll tell you pressure recovery in the adult patients is rarely uh, you really need it see it generally needs for the adolescents and the children because as i told you that if the aortic root is has a size less than 30 mm uh, then only you start thinking about the pressure recovery so lower it like it is more towards 20 22 23 or 15 18 that side you really th start thinking about the pressure recovery and pressure recovery is only the difference between the cath measurement of the gradient and the doppler measurement of gradient and that is because the whenever the vena contract has got a very high velocity and that kinetic energy recovers after some time at the sinotubular junction and gets converted into pressure uh, uh, pressure and that is why the pressure is slightly higher at the sinotubular junction so, so that is why the lv to the ascending aorta gradient is uh, slightly reduces and that is what is the pressure recovery so you calculate it by that formula and use it whenever the sinotubular junction is well below 30 mm so the question the uh, question of dr anuja kulkarni has already been answered how to calculate tvfr then next is bino bino vision how will aortic wall area calculation vary with mitral wall disease why not a direct aortic wall area on 3d as a as a board line yeah so yeah uh, it regarding the 3d area also 3d area it is it is really true that uh, uh, yeah, uh, possibly, we have to, why yeah. not this can be a gold standard correct so the thing is it is really true that if you can directly measure the aortic wall area nothing like it uh so the thing is in a 3d data set you can put your viewing plane exactly going at the tip of the leaflets and see it but the, there are certain technical issues many times there is so much of calcification which produces a shadowing in your 3d data set also so you do not get a very good resolution secondly the 3d data set also has got very few uh, ultrasound lines so the line density is less so again the pixel by pixel resolution is also less uh second thing is that this getting it uh, perfectly perpendicular even on the 2d data set on the biplane 3dt oh. is also very good but again the question comes about the heavy heavy calcification at the tips and at the commissures and uh, lastly even if this is the same problem even if you want to measure it by ct or mri but obviously that should be gold standard but again as i told you that patients who have got a low flow a uh, low flow that is low transvalvular flow rate the lv may not have a enough energy to push open the valve so whatever you are getting at the as a static may still be underestimated well, the question of dr anuja kulkarni has already been answered that please explain pressure recovery 
very important. Again, in a small aorta, less than 30 millimeters, so I think this has been explained. So, Dr. Monica Deleker, for ejection time calculation, should we use pulse Doppler or a CW? Now, please remember that when you are interrogating your stenosis, which is a high velocity, you are already using a CW Doppler. You are not using a pulse Doppler in these high flow states. So, it has to be a CW Doppler. Rupali Shah is severe calcification seen in parasitic long axis view. How should we measure LVOT diameter? Yes, this is a, a, a absolutely a very good technical question. Sometimes we'll find that the calcium is encroaching into the LVOT and it is really, really difficult to measure the LVOT diameter there. So, uh, so in that case, you, can, uh, you may not use the hinge points. Obviously, you can't use the hinge point because that is all calcified. You may come down into the LVOT and take the radius there. And remember, it is go not going to be perfectly accurate. But in any way, as I told you, that the Achilles heel of all measurement is the cross-sectional area. So in that case, what one can do is that if this patient is getting uh, evaluated for a tower, you will have a 3D data set of CT from which you can get the cross-sectional area. Uh, uh, even a 3D data set of ECHO is very difficult because of the calcium. Again, you will have the same issues. So definitely, that's a big uh, technical issue. That we have to uh, that we have to deal with. So, how do we risk stratify normal flow low gradient patients with a calcium score less than two thousand with underlying renal failure? Because I had two patients who were completely worked up from calcium score stress test, and despite that, had significantly progressed in requiring AVR. Very long question, not clear. So uh, first of all, the CT calcium score actually doesn't need any contrast. So we can do it in all the patients, whether they have a renal dysfunction or not. Secondly, uh, normal flow, low gradient aortic stenosis in the CS trial, which was actually a symbastatin trial for progression of aortic stenosis, showed that this particular group behaved like moderate AS and their long-term prognosis was very good. So now the question comes that if the patient is symptomatic and he has a normal flow, low gradient, then to do what guidelines are absolutely silent about this particular group but what i would suggest is that uh, do his exercise okay and see for the increment in the gradient and if it if there is an increment in the gradient and the wall area remains below one square centimeter and if there are symptomatic you can very well go ahead with the uh, with the surgery and generally the patients of normal flow low gradient do not have severe calcification and that is how they they are differentiated from the low flow low gradient severe as okay generally the normal flow uh, low gradient patients even the walls that are explanted during surgery do not show very heavy calcification or very severe thickening so probably i think these are the people who are actually moderate as but because of the guideline discrepancies and some certain uh, measurement errors they fall into this particular group so the uh, ACCAH guidelines do not uh, even recognize this particular group and all the guidelines, even the European guidelines are silent about this group. Well, Dr. Kakaria, please enumerate more of the parasternal window. In that case, say whenever the aorta dilates, it dilates toward the right side. So you turn the patient on his right side, put your probe near about second, third intercostal space, put a color flow mapping and wherever you see a turbulence, it is or just trial and error. Whenever you see a turbulence, you put your CWB on parallel to the flow and that is how you get a right parasternal window and you must practice in all the patients also. Dr. Jayashree Deshpande, can you share the slide? What we should report, that means she wants to know what we should report in a case of aortic stenosis in which you had put about eight, ten points or so. Yeah, uh, I think if uh, if you can uh, uh, download the article from the uh, journal can, of it, tell it, it, also also yeah. Uh, actually, there is an article in the JIA uh, on the uh, stress echo in aortic stenosis. Uh, in that, you will find this particular table of what to report in aortic stenosis. So you go to the site of Journal of Indian Academy of Echocardiography look for the uh, article of stress echo in aortic stenosis and in that you will get that entire guidelines. So, 
actually some questions are coming because of a, a, a doctor but target your comments on recovery trial do you submit all patient to surgery tavia despite symptoms i think the question not clear doctor but um, your comments on recovery trial do we submit all patient to surgery tavia despite symptoms the question may be clear you um, but not to me so dr golwala says what complications to anticipate in low dose dobutamine test uh actually in low dose dobutamine uh, stress is uh, is uh, the, the way is very safe most important thing is don't allow the heart rate to increase more than 10 bits that is one thing secondly monitor the blood pressure some patients with no contractile reserve their blood systolic blood pressure actually falls when you go from 5 mic to 10 mic so keep a watch on the blood pressure if the blood pressure falls on low dose dobutamine stop it because that itself tells you there is no contractile reserve and uh, generally we don't get any arrhythmias and never exit 20 mics because you are not doing it to stress the heart so most of the time we go from 5 7.5 10 15 15 and we stop at 15 if we start finding that the transvalvular flow rate is going about 200 or the stroke volume is going above 35 ml per meter square we generally stop at that point do you take lv over t velocity and vti also as a guide to stop it also uh, we generally don't take that uh, we uh, we generally take the whole One purpose or... yeah whole purpose okay. is twofold we have to show that there is a contractile reserve so we have to show that the stroke volume increases by 20% from baseline and second purpose is to measure the mean gradient and the uh, aortic wall area at a good flow at good hemodynamic that means when the stroke volume has increased and the transvalvular flow rate has increased so generally uh, we take the aortic wall area we take the uh, mean gradient and we also measure the uh, at by et that is uh, acceleration time divided by ejection time if it remains above 0.3 we are per perfectly sure that this has to be severe aortic stenosis and this at by et does not change whether you are parallel or not uh, really parallel to the aortic flow and and that is why its role in a paroxysmal low flow low gradient has been questioned because in a low flow low gradient because of hypertension severe lvh and we have got a very significant diastolic dysfunction like a restrictive physiology who respond very poorly to tachycardia and that is why the it is its role in in this group is very restricted because of the danger of tachycardia and further exacerbating the restrictive physiology Correct. Keep no. dobutamine only for low EF patients. For the normal EF patients, try to use the CT calcium yeah. score more. Yeah. Doctor, but Gonkar, in patients with severe AS and more than moderate MR, what are the predictors of MR regression after relieving AS? Uh, true. Uh, this has been properly investigated in the Traver trials, and it has been shown that 50% of these MRs regress. uh to uh, and some of them literally vanish also now which are the patients where, where it vanishes or reduces by at least two grades now these are the patients who do not have a structural change of the mitral leaflets so that means there are truly secondary mrs now if you have got a say mesomatous wall or heavily uh, degenerated calcific mitral wall those won't uh, recover but if you do not have a structural problem of the mitral leaflet then generally relieving the as 50% of them will show reduction in mr by at least two grades or complete vanishing of the mr2 uh, dr sabina hasham you have from bangladesh what is dimensional less index i think that you had explained also but if you might like to explain that Correct. So this is nothing but the LVOT VTI divided by aortic VTI, and you don't have any measurements, other measurements in the picture. So anything which is 0.25 or less, definitely it is severe. Anything above 0.3 may not be severe. Well, again, the 0.2, 0.25 to 0.3 is a gray zone. Uh, but remember, anything coming closer to 0.25 is definitely significant. And here the you are not taking cross-sectional area, so that's why it is called as a dimensionless index. the doctor sanim's question has already been asked that how to calculate valvular flow rate 
professor amuthan wants to know when do you use 3d in routine assessment of tower yes uh, especially if the patient's uh, uh, is a ckd uh, and you really can't do a detailed uh, ct study because that needs a significant amount of contrast uh, like suppose the patient is a ckd or a post -tran renal transplant patient and he has got a uh, and he's to undergo a tower in that case you have to completely depend upon the 3d tee very important to get very good images of the aortic root because so many things depend upon it you will get the uh, circumference of the lvot on that you will get the area on that circumference uh, you will use it if it is a if it is a self expanding wall and the area you use if it is going to be a balloon expandable wall then also you have to take perfect cuts to measure the coronary ostia heights in that and also you have to take the perfect measurement of the sinus of valsava uh, all these things are needed on the 3d te data set so it's extremely useful if there is a patient of ckd and he is undergoing tower well prabir chana your answer was question was answered that low flow can reduce gradient bulk but will it reduce wall area yes because it is the pushing force when there is a low output low stroke volume the pushing force is reduced as a result of it, the the aortic wall opening will be reduced and that is what uh, nitin said that a low flow low gradient you know a, a condition we see what is the response of the wall area after increasing the flow so yes it will affect it will reduce the wall area maybe pseudo or severe dr gulshan rai gls is not in the guidelines yet to select the patients for avr true the guidelines what do you yeah it is see, truly uh, but uh, the it will take a lot of time to come into the guidelines let me tell you that the valvular heart disease guidelines of acc aha if you if you carefully see it most of the uh, recommendation have a level of evidence c so that means they are most of their expert consensus there is hardly any data with a level of evidence b and almost nothing of level of evidence a so that is and they are fluid they are going to keep on changing so uh, and and we are seeing it that ejection fraction 50 if you wait you get lot of myocardial fibrosis and many of this patient continue to come in heart failure even after a good avr so i think it is time that we move ahead and if the gls is significantly reduced it is better that we go for an early avr dr jayashri deshpande please elaborate more on e oblique early diastolic strain rate uh actually we are also not using it i just showed it it is a uh, is a paper from uh, mayo what they did was instead of e prime which according to them the e prime only tells you about one part of the annulus lateral or medial it doesn't tell you about the entire lv early relaxation of entire lv so what they did was they took the strain rate of the lv and the early diastolic strain rate which is always a positive peak so that early diastolic strain rate they used it instead of e prime and that is why they took it e upon e strain rate in early diastole and uh, that they showed that if it was more than 1.04 post avr the patient had a higher incidence of heart failure admissions and higher mortality so so basically instead of e prime we were just putting in the strain rate uh, at point e that is the only thing well, the last question coming up is again from dr gulshan rai how to calculate av area by continuity question method if there is sub aortic stenosis or hokum you really can't use it and uh, having a severe calcific case also and an hocm uh, is uh, are very rare conditions secondly when you have a sub aortic uh, stenosis anyway uh, you don't go by aortic wall area but you just go by the gradients if your gradients are already above 60 you know that is a time to cut off that subaortic membrane so it really just doesn't make much uh, 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 it doesn't make much uh, sense for calculating the aortic wall area and in hocms actually more than hocm i think what you should look for in the patient of severe aortic stenosis is the thickness of this basal septum many time even after the avr if the septum remains thick it can produce an sam post uh, avr period and that can be quite vexing it can create a lot of problem so always look at that uh, uh, basal septal thickness before sending the patient for avr because the surgeon in that case 
while he cuts off the wall, can also shave off some part of the uh, basal uh, septum. So something like you can do a restricted myectomy also. The last two questions have again come up. One from Dr. Singaram, how to calculate ABA accurately in moderate AR and severe AS shall be used continue to equation? Because yes, I think can. the severe AS in moderate AR is already a severe aortic wall disease. Correct. So uh, we can definitely use it because we are looking at the flow only in one direction in continuity equation. So even if there is AR, we are not worried, but rather we are assured that you will never have a low flow situation there because the stroke volume is going to be higher. So we are not worried about it. So you can very well use the continuity equation in the patients of AR. Rather, you should use it because you will have, you will have a mismatch in the other way. That is, you have high gradients, but your aortic wall area may come 1.3 or 1.2 or 1.4, while your mean gradients may be well above 40. So in that case, you know that is a moderate AS with a, a severe aortic regurgitation. Well, very simple question. How to differentiate gradient of aortic stenosis and obstructive cardiomyopathy, I think the shape and what type it appears, all this, I think it is a mid and late systole, it is dynamic, changeable, and it is a dagger shape, while it is a aortic stenosis is more parabolic with a late peaking or something like this. So I think we had a very good discussion and most of the slides will be put up into the, uh, in the, in the, our IA website and, and you can go through these slides. If you have any doubt, you can always contact Dr. Nitin Gokhale, who has given a wonderful talk, and you can always get more clarifications. And on in the on the request of several people, the next webinar will be on a venous contrast echo, a saline contrast echo, in which about 15 to 20 very interesting cases will be shown by the faculty of All Institute of Medical Sciences. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burkile, for your great talk, and I hope everybody enjoyed it, and they can further, uh, they can get a clarification from you later on. Thank you very much, all of you, you participants. Thank you, thank you, sir.